recording to, or connecting to audio. Hello. Hey, Tina. Can you hear me, Tina? I hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Say hello to Scott Miller. Hi, Scott. Sorry, hello, I thought I was on mute, so y'all probably hear us doing dishes here. No, it's totally <laughs> no. fine. What this was for dinner, oh, Tina? No. What'd you have? My daughter made a yummy pasta and tomato basil mix, and it was delicious. Sounds good. That's an early dinner. Yes. That's an early dinner. Are you in the East Coast? I am central, so it's 5.30 here. Still yeah. kind of early, though. But I, I like good. early dinners. I like, it's like early bird for the young crowd. Right. Yes. <laughs> nice exactly. Well, I am so excited to have you all here today. I think we've got some more people that are going to be joining, but we're going to get started. Um, today, we're talking about things related to job loss, unemployment, and best practices in our careers. As you no doubt know, Scott is a best-selling author, a speaker, host of two podcasts now for Franklin Covey, and I always have to say this about you, Scott, one of the nicest people I know, truly. So thank you so much, first of all, for being here, Scott. Mindy, my pleasure. Uh, honored to be part of your team and your posse, <laughs> and I, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. It'll be a good talk. I am too. I'm, I'm very excited. I think it's a, a very timely issue. Um, so I'm, I'm going to dive in, you know, first of all, just for anyone who is, is listening and may have been hiding under a rock, would you mind just taking a second to tell us a, bit, a little bit about yourself and your own career journey? Sure. So uh, let's see. I'm 53. I live in Salt Lake City with my wife and our three young sons who are Let's see, seven, nine, and eleven. To my That's wife's four, they all have my personality and and uh, energy. Uh, I'm not from Salt Lake. I lived here for 25 years. I'm from Florida originally. I was born and raised in Central Florida, Orlando. Worked for the Walt Disney Company for four years. Mm -hmm. uh, after that departure, which we can talk about if you want to, I I went looking for a career, and uh, the Franklin Covey Company came calling. That's, of course, Stephen Covey's company. He was the author of the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This company is now a global public company. One of my favorite largest, books. Yeah, thank you. The largest leadership firm in the world. And I started at the front line and became a salesperson. And then 26 years later, I ended my career here after 10 years in the C-suite as the chief uh, marketing officer. I was also the executive vice president of thought leadership. I retired from the company a year ago. When I say retired, not like, like yacht retired, just like, okay, that's enough. I'm done 26 <laughs> years. I want to do some more things. So I retired mm -hmm. from the company. I'm still an ambassador for them. And I'm a consultant and a, an advisor to the company. I still lead their public relations strategy, their book strategy and thought leadership, but I'm not an officer. I can go do things I want to do. And now I'm an entrepreneur and uh, writing books, speaking, hosting podcasts, things like that. So uh, a very strong, fulfilling 30-year career. Mm -hmm. And I have a seven-year-old, so there's no such thing as retirement. Right. <laughs> very true. So you actually read my mind. I, I want to move on to, to this. But you know, so many people, like I was saying, this is so timely. So many people have been affected by job loss recently with furloughs and layoffs related to the pandemic and you know, who knows what else. But more broadly, I think this is really something that so many of us experience at one time or another in our career. I've been affected by corporate layoffs twice. And both times, I can genuinely say that in retrospect, you know, it was hard to go through, but it was the best thing that could have happened for me and for my career both times. So you mentioned Disney, and you told me previously that you were actually fired from Disney, and I suppose the joke is on them. But would you, oh, I don't know. <laughs> would you tell us, you know, what that looked like and how it maybe did or didn't affect you back then? So let's see. I was 26 when Disney exited me. It has spent four years there. An amazing journey. Learned a ton. No hard feelings. I was a bit of a jackass. I was young. I was 26, <laughs> going on 14. Uh -huh. I was your typical, typical, you know, employee that was highly talented but was unfocused, and I was. Um, 
annoying and gossipy and disorganized and not managing my corporate credit card well just kind of a bit of a wreck right I kind of was like uh, in over my head yeah. not from a technical standpoint but Disney was a fairly strict company kind of button down culture and yeah. again I have I have nothing but great memories including my departure actually um, um, as I look back on it probably the probably the best day of my career journey was the day that they exited me because I didn't really want to work for Disney. It was a hometown company. I learned a ton. It was a great brand, uh -huh. but it wasn't my career. It was sort of accidental. It wasn't a real deliberate career uh -huh. choice. Huh. And so when they let me go, it forced me to get serious at the, at, at the age of 26. What did I really want to do? And where did I want to live? And uh -huh. what kinds of careers did I want to pursue? So as I look back, I, for most people, the worst day of your life is the day you're fired. And, this, and the best day is the day after you're fired, or <laughs> metaphorically, right? When right. you start to realize, okay, well, that's done and nothing I can do about it. So now what am I going to do? What do I get to do? Most times, not all the time, but most times when people are exited from their job, where it's mm -hmm. not their choice, I think you should look at it as a gift. No, for a moment, put aside the horror of your finances and how right. am I going to pay next week's bills? I don't mean to be at all. I mean, my, I didn't have months of income saved. Right. They, they gave me a severance that I think was maybe three months or so, which was pretty generous back then. And it ran out the day I took a new job, as a matter of fact, that I had yeah. very little savings. I was 26. Who has a savings account when you're 26 more than three months? And so yeah. putting aside the financial horror of losing your job, if you can look at it through the gift of they acted upon me, perhaps when I never would have acted upon myself, how do I look at the bright side of this? What is the silver lining? And I, don't, right. I don't mean for that to be Pollyannish no. or naive. I get the fright, the horror, the, you know, the unsettled nature of losing your job. It's tough. Yeah. It's like, it's like getting divorced. Not exactly, but close. So yeah. It was a good experience for me in hindsight. The time I was panicked, the mm -hmm. time I was fearful. I remember I had a BMW in Orlando and the, and the air conditioning had just gone out. Well, you need air conditioning in Orlando in yes. this summertime. True story. Especially when you're interviewing for a job and you're sweating through your shirts and things. But, yeah. you know, if you can look long-term in life, most things are bumps in the road. No one was injured. Mm -hmm. Maybe I was injured. Maybe my, my ego was injured, but I, I, it taught me to think longer term. Yeah. Well, and, and you said, I, I, it sounded kind of like you and I maybe had a similar experience with our, my, my first experience. I don't with know. The, Were you mismanaging your corporate credit card? I was not doing well, that. Well, then we didn't have, uh, a, then we didn't have <laughs> a similar experience. No, no, no. <laughs> but I, I, what I will say is that, you know, it, it was, I was about the same age that you were. I was about 26 or 27 when I was laid off from yeah. a job for the first time. And, you know, I had had a, a pretty good career progression yeah. to that point. I'd been with the company, I think about six and a half years and I was doing pretty well, but I didn't take it real seriously. And so, you know, what it served to do for me at that period in my life was to really, I think, kind of wake me up and teach me about work ethic yeah. and, you know, all of those sorts of, of things. Were you, yeah. Well, ahead. similar to me. I mean, I, similar, but different. I think my I think I took my career very seriously, but I, when I was, I was a fairly immature 20 year old guy yeah. where I didn't realize the consequences of my decisions and how important your reputation is to you and mm -hmm. how important your, your brand is. Right. And so I learned some very valuable lessons early on. Oh, I see. Yeah. These are no deals. And I need to be more cautious and careful and deliberate around the decisions. I mean, nothing unethical or immoral, but just, you know, yeah not paying my corporate credit card on time and always being in trouble with employee reimbursement and accounting and finance. And it just kind of spiraled up. And right. Kristen, you missed a great confession. Uh, Mindy tried to compare her first termination to mine. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Did you mismanage your corporate credit card? She says, well, no. So I'm like, well, there's no, there's no correlation at all. Yeah. Well, there, there, there still could be just a little bit, maybe. Look at all of Kristen's degrees back there, flaunting all her education. I know. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Kristen. Way to go, girl. Way to go. You earned those. Hang those proud. 
Kristen's a, a pediatrician, right, Kristen? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Still at work, still just finishing up, but I didn't want to miss this. So oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm very excited. I miss you, Mindy. I've missed your face. I've missed you too. I'm really glad that you're here. Um, so, so Scott, what, what would you, and you, you went into this space just a little bit as you were talking, but you know, for anybody that's listening now or, or may tune in later who may be sitting in that space of, you know, the, the, the initial kind of shock and fear and, you know, all of the anxiety that can come with losing a job, you know, maybe you've got a family, maybe, you know, there are a lot of things in our yeah. lives that it can affect what, what would be your advice to them? A couple of things. One is learn how to compartmentalize. Don't let the horror around your finances bleed into your self-confidence. Don't let the fact that perhaps they let you go, but not somebody else go, get into your mind. But, you know, compartmentalize. Okay. I've got concern around my finances. I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling like this is a great opportunity for me to explore new things, or perhaps Maybe I should pivot and work on new skills. Don't let all that dog pile on you at one time. That's the first thing. Learn to compartmentalize. It might be a great thing for you. Don't let the fact that you're wondering how you're going to pay your mortgage this month or eat next week dilute the fact that it could be a good long-term thing for you. Do your best to compartmentalize. Second, don't be shameful. Talk about it. Lost my job. Got fired. Don't hide it from your spouse. Don't hide it from your mother-in-law. It happens. It happens all the time, every day to a million people around the world. People get laid off, they get reassigned, they get downsized, they get furloughed, they get fired all the time. This is not an indictment on you unless you were managing your corporate credit card wrongly. <laughs> now, my point is most times it's not an indictment on anything to do with you. Yeah. So stop taking everything so personally. What's that book, The Four Agreements? It's an amazing book, right? One of the agreements is don't take it so personally. Talk about it, process it out loud. And I'd say perhaps most importantly, and I love this paradigm, sometimes a disappointment turns into an appointment, an appointment for something else. Huh? Perhaps, you know, it can be more than just a job loss. It could be relationship ends. It huh? could be a client fires you. It could be a deal that you thought you were going to get, but it didn't work out. Sometimes an appointment turns into an appointment. Okay, I got fired. Now, what am I going to do? Well, I don't have to drive 30 miles to that office anymore. I don't have to deal with that horrible leader. I don't have to deal with that petty person. I mean, there is going to be a silver lining, sometimes easier found than others. I have lots of clients that I had, I had a six-figure client. Actually, I didn't. I had a, I had a, I had a possible six-figure client that I spent a ton of time on and working on it. It didn't work out. It was a disappointment to me. It was a financial loss for me. But the moment that I realized it was out of my control, like in seconds, uh -huh. I said, well, there comes a thousand free hours. How am I going to go spend that thousand free hours literally doing something else? Uh -huh. and again, I don't mean to gloss over the financial impact of losing your job, but don't collude emotions. Don't collude them together. Don't let your fear about your finances diminish your self-confidence. Don't let your excitement around something you always wanted to do be lessened because you're so panicked about something else. All of those are very valuable feelings. Do your best to separate them and deal, do, do, deal, them, deal with them a bit differently. I'm actually fairly good at how I talk to myself, Mindy. I do not trash talk myself. I don't talk down to myself. I don't denigrate myself. I don't say, well, I can't do that, or I don't can't do that. Now, there's a difference between being self-confident and being a narcissist. There's a difference yeah. between being self-confident and being a sociopath. Uh -huh. But I am very deliberate around how I talk to myself. Uh -huh. And I use positive, deliberate terms to buoy myself up. A lot of people see it as arrogance. I see it as confidence. If I don't believe in me, who else is going to? So I am increasingly deliberate around the words I use out loud and in my head to describe myself. If somebody else thinks it's arrogance, that's what that, that's them. Yeah. I have to be my own biggest cheerleader. 
That is such good advice because you're, you're absolutely right. All of that, you know, the, the negative self-talk and, and all of the anxiety and the shame and, you know, whatever it's, it's going to de- to detract from what you can then go and offer somebody in an interview. I, let me take it a step further. Yeah. Your job is a career. Your job is not your life. And as sure. Americans, we're almost unidentifiable by most of the world. Italians, the French, the Swiss, their jobs aren't their life. Their job is like what they do from nine to four, right? I mean, you would never go to a cocktail party and have an Italian tell you what they did for a living. In the US, your title is your badge of honor, your W-2, your 401k. I mean, we're obsessed with these things. So let me remind everybody, especially those of you who are single. I was single up until I was 41. I got married at 41. Up until then, my career was my entire identity. If I was at a cocktail party, I would find some way to work in, well, I'm the general manager of so-and-so, or well, yeah, last year I made, you know, uh, so, yeah. I mean, honestly, I would somehow find a way to work in my compensation because my career was my identity. Your job is your career. Your job is not who you are. Mm-hmm. I don't care. I mean, look, you've got Chris on the phone, Kristen. Kristen's more educated than anybody I know. This woman is a physician. She's uh-huh. been to so much schooling. Of course, part of who she is is a, is a physician. This yeah. is a big accomplishment. She's gone to triple the school I have. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's, it's, it's difficult for us to make sure that we don't wrap our self-worth, our self-confidence into our professions. Yeah, It's not who we are. It's a part of who we are. Don't let a disruption of that decided by somebody else else impact your self-worth worth or your self-confidence so good or your self-esteem yeah yeah it's so true so you know with with my i'm gonna switch gears just a little bit here but you know with my most recent layoff experience at the time i was managing a team and having to tell them that their jobs were moving overseas weighed so heavily on me as as a management and leadership expert yeah. what's your best advice for for people in a situation where they have to lay off the people or let the people yeah. go who are working for them first of all you never do it in a group never ever ever we've learned from the press you never do it on zoom but uh, you never do it in a group you call people off one on one separately yeah because everyone's got different Reaction. Some people might have PTSD. Some people might have a trauma going on in their home. Some people may hear it and figure out where am I going to sleep tomorrow night because I'm already two months behind on my rent. So the first thing is you never do it in front of someone else. Now you might have someone witness it or in your office, you know, for legal reasons, but you do not do it in a group. You do it individually. Yeah. That's the first rule of thumb. You never call your team together and say everyone is losing their jobs. That, that, that is cruel and inhumane. Because some people, some people might have a trust fund. Some might have already had it land in a job. They're like, yoo severance. I mean, you always do it separately. Secondly, you talk straight. You do not obfuscate. You don't have them in the office for five minutes. And then all of a sudden you find yourselves talking about your, no, no, no. You walk them in and you say, Mindy, thank you for coming in today. I have a difficult conversation to have with you. Um, your job is being eliminated today. It's a decision that is irreversible. I know this is going to be upsetting to you, but I want to respect to you to share this news in the beginning of this conversation as we talk about all of the options that you now have in front of you. Now, you may have no options. You may have a lot. I mean, my point is you say it very clearly out of the gate, as humanely as possible, in probably the first 10 words. Mindy, thank you for coming in today. I have some difficult news to share with you. As of today, your, no, your job no longer exists or your last day with this company is going to be Friday. Your job has been eliminated. Yeah. The decision is not negotiable. The decision is final. I know this is going to be emotional upsetting. What I'd like to do now is talk to you about the consequences of that decision and all the options that we have in front of us. You know, you might say it different for each person. Mm-hmm. You might be, you might have a severance to offer. You might have some career coaching. You might have, you know, here's how you set up for unemployment today. You yeah. might have, we have another plant that you might be able to be transferred to. You, you might add none of those options. Huh? That's why you do it differently. And you say it very 
very directly but compassionately upfront without beating around the bush or obfuscating or giving the person any hope. If there's no hope, then make it very clear. This decision is final. It's not up for consideration. I'm happy to answer any and all questions you have, but the decision is final. And then perhaps paint a vision. Yeah. Mindy, I am sure there's a lot of emotions going through your mind. This is where you might move over a box of Kleenex, right? You might have closed the shades, depending upon what you know about the person. Yeah. And now very humanely you say, you know, I know this is emotional for you. And I want to take some time for you to gather your thoughts. I would encourage you not to take this personally. It's hard. It's difficult. This is not an indictment on your work. I'm not sure there were things you could have done differently. Maybe you say that regardless of the facts to make sure yeah. the person is, you know, feeling humanely treated. And then if it's possible, paint a vision. Mindy, you have so many talents. There are so many organizations. Do you know there are 70,000 employers in the greater Dallas area? You know, LinkedIn is on fire. Mindy, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I think you're going to be an amazing commodity. Not everybody has to work here. Yeah. You know, think along. So I would just, without, without being artificially disingenuous, mm -hmm. paint a vision, remind them. Yeah, you're right. Dallas is a big town, right? This is an employing amazing market right now. This, is, this might actually be a great chance for you to think about what is it you want to do next? Yeah. Maybe you go back to school. Now, again, you know, if you're talking to a single mom that has, you know, no support system, you have to be thoughtful about not making up things that are, you know, not legitimate, but do it alone. Mm -hmm. Do it compassionately and swiftly up front. Be very clear on if there's any options or not, and then paint a vision for what's possible for them after this. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really Pardon good. Me. Bless you. Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, so I, I suspect that in your entire career, you've probably been in this position where maybe you've had to All lay people off or, yeah. or let them go. Yeah. How did you take care of yourself in that situation? And, you know, knowing that you were having to do something that was going to affect yeah. this person in very real ways. In 30 years, I've had the honor of interviewing thousands of people and the privilege of hiring hundreds and the responsibility of terminating dozens. Huh? Each one is a little bit different. Some people I've terminated because they were stealing from the company. Yeah. Others I terminated because they were incapable of managing themselves. They were not self-aware and they were just a train wreck. Some people, they just, it was the wrong job, it was the wrong fit. Others, there was a downsizing where I was told to cut a half million dollars in 24 hours and I had to come up with nine names. And that's how it happened. Hmm. Each one is different. I, you know, it was not robotic. It wasn't cookie cutter, but I followed the same process. Like I, I set out, I did them one-on-one. -on -one. I did them very swiftly. I asked them, could I ask you a favor? You're going to be tempted when you leave here to go tell everybody you were just laid off. Could I ask you a favor? Could you walk to your car and take a drive? Or could you walk over to the coffee shop? Because I don't want other people to work through the anxiety or fear. There are some more departures happening today. And I don't want to wreck everybody's morning. As a courtesy to your other colleagues, could you not text everybody else and tell them? Yeah. I think it's important you don't say to somebody, hey, um, can I talk to you at four o'clock today? Now you've like ruined their nine hours, right? right? I mean, you don't do that at all. You yeah. call them in. Hey, could you join me for a second? You call them right in, you get it done. Hopefully at the end of the day, recognizing that there's more than one layoff, you do them as swiftly as possible. Yeah. I think you treat people with enormous kindness and compassion. This is a traumatic event. Most people are going to immediately take it fairly personally. And the more junior they are, the more panicked they're gonna be about their economics. Immediately they're gonna to go to, how am I gonna afford? They're, yeah. they're, right? So if you've got some financial options, say it first. Mindy, I have some bad news. Your role has been eliminated and today is going to be your last day here. And we're going to provide you with seven weeks of compensation. So they hear that. They hear yeah. it immediately. I've got seven weeks. Right. And we've got some career counseling. Mm -hmm. Or, Mindy, your job's being eliminated. 
you're going to have one more week here. Unfortunately, the company is going through bankruptcy and there won't be a severance, but we have all the forms printed off so you can immediately apply for unemployment assurance. And I've done some talking about some recruiters and you, know, you might have some ideas for them. So you at least let them know immediately they have some options. Okay. I think each okay. one is a little bit different based on the person and on your relationship with them and what you know about them. Of course. Okay. That's, that's all really good. Let's get into the, some of the tactics of a job search, you know, just real quickly. What do you, what do you think is, is more important? You hear the adage, it's not what you know, it's who, you know, but what do you think is more important? What you know, or who, you know, when you're undergoing a job search? Well, both are important, right? Because you might be my cousin. But if you're not a, if you've not graduated medical school with a certification as a pediatrician, they're not joining this practice, right? So I mean, you know, I say that because Kristen you said was a pediatrician. Right. So you know, having the technical skills is is vital. But I think networking cannot be denied. You know, statistically, eighty percent of all jobs are filled through some kind of referral or network. Eighty percent of oh, all wow. jobs are filled because someone referred you in 80 oh, percent i would have thought it was high i don't know if i would have guessed yeah. that high yeah those are the statistics from recruiters in the industry so i answered your question i mean building a reciprocally high trust mutually beneficial network is everything it might be through yeah. linkedin it might be through your community or your church or some philanthropic groups i think it's important for people especially that are long-term employees People that have had tenure in a company for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, most of your network, unless you're in sales, is likely inside that company. Right. So be very thoughtful about building a network outside of your just immediate practice or group or platform or division. Mm -hmm. You want to be very deliberate. Absolutely. Who you know is how you're going to get the job. What you know is going to help you qualify for the interview and get secure the job, you know, because I know you does not mean I will get the job. Mm -hmm. It's likely why I will get the interview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what would you say then to someone who maybe in this moment has lost their job and they don't have a strong network that they can tap into, aren't particularly well connected? Um, what, what can someone in that situation do? Well, first let's rewind. The best time to plant a tree is yesterday and the be second best time is today, right? I butchered that proverb, but you get the point. So you, so let's first talk to everybody in general, yes. build your network. That mm -hmm. might mean different things to different people, but you have to dig your well before you're thirsty. Now, to answer your question, if you don't have a great network, let's assess what it is. Write down the names, you know, draw out a tree. Like, who do I know? my grandfather, my mm -hmm. grandmother, my neighbors, my rabbi, my ex-boss. I mean, whoever it is, you know, you know somebody, yeah. you know someone. So I would start listing out all those that you do know and kind of get a real good sense. It might not be as thin as you think it is. It might actually be better than you think it is. Mm -hmm. So first is do a reality check. And, and then I think it's important to discern, you know, how do you want to go about building it? Mm -hmm. You want to make sure you're not opportunistic, or if you are, simply say, "Hey, you know, I'm in a bind and I'm looking for a job. Is there any way that you know you might have any leads to connect me?" Quite frankly, I'm a little bit embarrassed that I haven't built my network better. I, 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 I had a network, but all of it's in my firm, and I was kind of caught off guard. Yeah, I would be transparent. If you want someone's help, yeah, ask them. You know what? I need your help. I'm in a bind. Mm -hmm. I've lost my job. My network is thinner than it needs to be. I've learned a valuable lesson there. And I wonder if you might be able to help me at all. That's much, I think, more endearing than kind of masquerading as, you know, well, I'm just connecting because I follow your work or right? I'm fast. No, be, be genuine about that. If you're yeah. looking for someone's help, be forthright. Yeah. And your LinkedIn is a tool you can't afford to deny. Right. You've got to be building your LinkedIn and adding value to your network, whether it be through a blog or through videos or book recommendations or podcasts you like or whatever it is, you want to be adding back to your community. But I think the most important point is dig your well before you're thirsty and make sure that you are building a network that others benefit from. Here's mm -hmm. a great example. I mean, look at you and I. We've never met. Not in person. Not in person. 
-hmm. We've never met in person. Doesn't matter how we discovered each other. You and I became fast friends on social media. We've had multiple phone calls. We've emailed, we've texted, we message. You've been on my podcast. I've been on yours and I'm here today. And you and I add value to each other, not just professionally, not what you can do for me, but we're friends. If I came to Dallas, I would come to your house, non-COVID. And if you came to Salt Lake, so I mean, you and I have developed a great example of how two people actually in very different worlds with different lifestyles and families and needs and professions and educations. We've built a lovely friendship that I think has been built on transparency and mutual benefit, but also a care for each other. And I figure I count you as a friend of mine. Oh, we never well, met in person. Likewise. Oh, That's the essence of building a network. Yeah. Good, very good point. And I do want to reiterate what you said about LinkedIn, because prior to, I would say three years ago, when I needed it, and I was going through my last, um, that my last job search, I really underestimated LinkedIn. And the more I used it, the more value I saw. I love LinkedIn now. It's such a good tool. Yeah, it's a tool that should be central to every professional's lives, including if you're like, for example, Kristen, who's off camera, which is fine because she's worked a full day. But, you know, Kristen may decide that she wants to move to Oklahoma City. Uh-huh. <laughs> or San Francisco or some, some great city. Or Austin. Fine. And she might be interested in looking for a new practice there, right? And so she should be connecting to every pediatrician every practice around the country, sharing best practices. And you never know when she might be invited to speak on a, on a, on a, on a platform or a conference or somewhere or whoever it is. Maybe she might decide to become a concierge doctor, wants to know, how do I launch that, right? Um, that's where the money is, is in concierge medicine, Kristen. You got to pivot, I'm telling you, that's where the money is. Uh, you get the point though, right? I think yeah. no matter what, even if you're not a professional, now maybe if you're like you know 80 and retired and you're won the lottery, but I think there's a great reason to be on LinkedIn for nearly every professional. You never yep. know when you're going to need it. It's true. It's very, very or true. Or someone might need you, right? Someone might be moving to Dallas and say, hey, my husband's a pediatrician. Do you know of any practices? As a matter of fact, we have three openings right here. Come on over and interview, right? Absolutely. So, so personally, you know, kind of um, sticking with the, the job search strategy, personally, the last time... I was was in this boat. I, I cast um, so many sailing references. Yeah. Why? Um, but I cast a really wide net when I when I left my last company, and I really played a numbers game. I did have a really healthy network as well, but I chose to to play a numbers game. And at the end of ten months, I can tell you, I've got the spreadsheet to prove it. I could show it to you. I had applied at the end of 10 months for 341 jobs and I had interviewed for 53 of those and you know nothing was was taking. Um, I also happen to believe that it was because I was kind of being led in a different direction um, to be doing the work that I'm doing now. Um, but when a, a person is job hunting, what do you think works best? playing that numbers game yeah, and casting yeah. a wide net or being more strategic and focused on a particular type of opportunity? Well, it could be situational based on where you are in your career. It's kind of like dating. The key to dating I hear is volume, 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 right? Because yeah. you speed date and you get a sense for, you know, you're, you're, you're better adept at, you know, who's a charlatan and who's a flim flam artist and, you know, who looks good, but talks, you know, too good of a game. <laughs> You can play a numbers game, but I'd argue there's two types of career searches. I'm going to call it net fishing and spear fishing. Net fishing is you throw out a broad net and you scoop up everything. Every tuna, every flounder, every grouper, every eel, every rusted bicycle, every tire, and every anchor. You get it all. You got enough for a, uh, a, a, a nautically themed restaurant to make your decorations. And that might work for someone who's early on in their career, right? Just starting out and doing something early. I think there's a place for what I would call net fishing, which is basically what you did. In times of tough economic troubles where jobs are at a premium, net fishing might be a good strategy. Uh -huh. Alternatively, I would say that spear fishing is probably a better strategy, right? I'm going to find tuna. And I've got a spear. I, this is a bit macabre, but run with me. <laughs> and I'm going out to where I know the tuna are and I'm going to find a tuna. I'd argue 
that in most cases, spear fishing is better than net fishing. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, if you're looking just to get a job and you're looking for healthcare benefits, I mean, that's all you need is 18 bucks an hour and some healthcare benefits because your spouse has a great job or whatever is going on in your situation, you might find that net fishing is good for you. I'd say for professionals, people with an articulated education or skill set, uh -huh. spear fishing is always going to be better. Uh -huh. but can, I, can I pivot for a second? Of course. And that is, I think there are two types of professionals. There's generalists and there's specialists. Yes, you read my mind. Kristen is a specialist. The odds that she's going to become a commercial real estate agent are zero. The odds that she's going to become a commercial airline pilot are zero. I'm a generalist. The odds that I'm going to become a pediatrician are negative zero. It ain't <laughs> happening, not going to happen. Okay. I'm an author. I, I'm a project manager. I'm a podcast host. I'm a speaker. I'm a writer. I'm a blogger. I'm a sales professional. I'm a marketing leader. And I think it's important to know, are you a generalist? Are you a specialist? Mm -hmm. And what I found is most generalists are quite jealous of specialists early on in their career. Uh -huh. I don't know, Kristen, she seems lovely. She's clearly competent by her association with you and the stuff behind her head on the wall. But I'll bet you Kristen came out of college quite clear what it was she was going to do. And she probably had some debt and she went immediately into private practice and started earning money immediately. Meanwhile, the generalists are out there going, holy crap, what am I gonna do? Uh -huh. I got Kristen over here who's rocking and rolling right now. Maybe has more debt than I do, but she's going to pay it back. And she's confident and knows who she is and has an identity. And I'm like, am I a project manager? Am I in sales? Am I in marketing? Yeah. What, what am I in? I mean, at a cocktail party, Kristen's rocking and rolling. Everyone's on her because they know what she is. On me, they're like, who's that pariah? <laughs> Here's what happens. And Kristen, no harm, no foul. I think a lot of generalists early on are quite insecure, intimidated, jealous yeah. of the confidence portrayed by the specialist the patent attorney, the chemical engineer, the anesthesiologist, the librarian, the educator. Mm -hmm. And then there's all of us that over the course of our 20s and 30s, we don't realize it, but we're kind of coming into ourselves and we're learning all these skills and we're uncovering what we do and don't like, what are our passions, what are our fears, what are our talents. And then for many of us in our 40s and in our 50s, it kicks in. Yeah. If you would have told me when I was 22, I was going to be a fairly renowned podcast host and author and public speaker, I would have said, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh -huh. But th that's meant to say specialists and generalists are great. Right. Don't be jealous of each other. Don't be comparing yourself. If you're a generalist, do not compare yourself to a specialist. If you're a specialist, don't compare yourself to a generalist. You're on different tracks. Right. And I think once you realize are you a generalist? If someone had told me in my 20s, Mindy, long answer to your question, Scott, relax. Stop being jealous of Kristen. Stop being jealous of her security, uh -huh. of her title, of her confidence, of her competence, of her options. Take the next 15 years, learn all these skills, project management, relationships, public speaking, managing a PL, diffusing mm -hmm. conflict. It's going to work out. Just trust yourself. Don't be immediately insecure. I would have much more enjoyed the ride. I would have been yeah. less paranoid around what's next. And what's next is, okay, so you're saying there's light at the end of the tunnel. No one told me in my 20s that I was a generalist. I spent all my time being shamed by or eclipsed by the jealousy I had of specialists. Now, maybe I'm the only human to ever have felt that way. Now, I think the opposite is true. I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of jealousy from specialists huh? with generalists. You mean, I got to check, I got to check kids' throats for the next 40 years? I got to do something different in my 40s or 50s. I, maybe not. You get the point, right? Yeah. There's a lot of patent attorneys that would love to pivot into something different. It doesn't mean that generalists can't become specialists and specialists can't become generalists. But I think owning that phase of your life really helps you to determine what kind of career search should you pursue, net fishing or spear fishing.
so good. And gosh, my, my brain is being flooded with, with things that I want to say. There was so much good stuff in there, but I think that you're, I think you're absolutely right. And for me, in my example that I gave, I, I'm, I was a generalist, you know, I worked in management. I was a project manager. I was a program manager, my ma manager. I was a product manager. I did all of these different things. And, and a lot of the time it felt sort of, I don't want to say chaotic, but you know, it was, it was kind of like, but, but when do I get to that point in my career where I really know what I am? You know what I mean? And so, but because I had such a broad, um, you know, breadth of experience, I was also able to apply for a lot of different kinds of jobs. Um, so yeah, I, there's so much to what you said. I think Mindy, great illustration. I think it's, there's a middle ground. I think too much serendipity and you'll always have an accidental career. Mm -hmm. Perhaps too much fierce deliberation. Mm -hmm. You'll either fulfill a dream your parents had for you or you'll do something that you never really questioned and said, do I really love being a CPA? I mean, do I really love this? I think the middle ground is the right level of deliberateness. Thinking yeah. out 30 years from now, what does success look for me like, like for me? What does joy look like? What does meaning, what does contribution look like? And, and kind of balancing that serendipity with that deliberateness on your career. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, too much la-di-da can lead you a career where you've never got any traction. Your skills aren't that valuable. I know a lot of people that are, have an encyclopedic knowledge of pop culture. Last time I checked, Exxon doesn't need that. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to be thoughtful around the skills that you're building because if your skills aren't a, mock, a, a marketable commodity, then no one's going to pay for them. So you've, you've got to balance that, that kind of that sort of effervescent back and forth, if you will, with your serendipity, doing things you enjoy and love, and also doing things and learning skills that someone's willing to pay for. Yes, that's, that's really good. So Scott, you, you have achieved so much success. You made your way, like you said, to chief marketing officer, executive vice president of business development at Franklin Covey, the podcasts, the books. What is the smartest thing you ever did for yourself in your own career? Two things. Can I share two things? You please. One, I always aligned myself with cash generation. Everybody knew how Scott contributed to the money-making model of the company. Mm. That's very important. First, you got to know what is your money-making model. Mm -hmm. You have to know there's five parts of every money-making model. Cash, margin, velocity, customers, and growth. Those are the five parts of every money-making model. Mm -hmm. Cash, margin, velocity, customers, and growth. So I made very sure that everybody knew what my contribution was to our money-making model. So it was difficult to get rid of me. I was the last person to get canned because I was bringing money in the door. Or conversely, some people might be, might be part of cash conservation, saving money, right? Either you're either making money for the company or you're saving money, profit or not for profit. Mm -hmm. Same thing. So one is make sure you have aligned yourself with the money-making model of your company. That's the first thing. Great. The second thing is I always disrupted myself. I always fired myself before someone else could fire me. I never wanted my boss to come to me and say, you know, we've been thinking that never ends well. Right. So I always gave myself the boot one or two or three years before I thought someone might come for me. So I often moved way outside my comfort zone. And I left now, by the way, I had 26 years at Franklin Covey, 25 right. or so. Now I'm a consultant to them. But I always moved myself out of my job before I became noticeably complacent. Because it happens to us, right? There comes a time in your career where it's no longer a challenge. You kind of can do it in your sleep. And what happens is most of us think we're hiding that complacency, but we're not. Others see it. And that's when the CFO finds it acceptable to put your name on her elimination list and, or the CHRO. Well, I mean, you know, you get the point. You want to make sure you are disrupting yourself before you and anybody else starts to believe you're getting bored. And so those are the two things I've done exceptionally well yeah. is I heard someone once, Cindy, say something horrifying, repulsive, but it was so valuable. She said, 
You're never in the room when your career is decided for you. And I think it's so true, especially in organizations. Yeah. I never wanted somebody else deciding my career for me, where, you know, they close the shades in the CFO's office and they got to find a million dollars and they put up nine projects and 15 names on the whiteboard or the chart pad and they add up how much they're going to save on this. Yeah. That is somebody else deciding your career for you. Yeah. I never wanted to be in that spot. So I took fierce control to make sure that if I wanted to stay, it'd be painful for them to get rid of me because I brought in so much money or I saved them so much money. And secondly, that I had options. Yeah. I never wanted someone to walk in and say, Scott, we've been thinking. I wanted to make sure that I had options on the front end. That doesn't mean that I always lived my life with a strong plan B or a strong plan C, uh -huh. but I had a plan B and I had a plan C. It didn't, it didn't dictate my life, but I never wanted to turn over my career, my financial well-being my self-worth, my self-confidence to anybody else. I want to be in control of my life. So Sometimes maybe too much. That's, yeah, I, I, I'm curious to know, you know, the, the, the first one that you mentioned, is that something that you deliberately did or did you just kind of figure it out as you made your way through? Both, your both. I started to see patterns in companies and uh -huh. people that were sort of, elusive like now what do they do and could so and so do that and can we save 60 grand there and what well, do we really have to have that is that like mission critical i mean i saw i started to see patterns early on huh? and i wanted i want it wasn't so much wanting to protect my job huh? i wanted to make the decision about my own career i yeah. did not want anyone else deciding my future for me yeah so I, I was very deliberate, making sure that I was in control. And the best way I could determine that was to make sure that it, was, it would be really painful to fire me. Yeah. Painful meaning that, you know, Scott may cost us $100,000 a year, but he brings in $800,000 a year. So let's go to a different name. Let's right. go to somebody else. Mm -hmm. now, now, not everybody has that luxury. Not everybody's in sales. Not right. everybody is in finance, right? But if you're in marketing, if you're in operations, if you're in human resources, if you're in supply chain, uh -huh. whatever you're in, make sure that it is crystal clear how you drive one of those five things, margin, cash, velocity, customers, and growth. Because when they bring your boss in to say, hey, we need you to cut $400,000, they skip over your name because your comp, your comp, your competency, your expertise is like, yeah, yeah, we cannot, we can't, Scott negotiates all these great deals for the company or he, he runs okay. partnerships or he runs the conference and that conference brings in 40 new leads a quarter or Scott runs email marketing automation. That's the lifeblood of our lead generation. Let's go somewhere else. Right. To me, I found it a bit of a force field. Now it's not foolproof, right? I mean, yeah. layoffs are layoffs and COVID is COVID and bankruptcies are bankruptcies, but nine times out of 10, if you align yourself with mission critical duties in your company, they're going to skip over you. Okay. They're going to that's, find the money somewhere else. That's great advice. So on the flip side of that, and we've talked about your, um, your uh, corporate card, you know, issues, but, but what was the biggest mistake that you ever made in your career? Can I tell you, Mindy, I've not made a lot of big mistakes. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I've not made a lot of big mistakes. I've been quite strategic. Mm -hmm. We can talk about what that means. I mean, listen, you know, I, I, I've been in trouble before. My human resource file is as thick as anybody's because <laughs> I say what's on my mind and uh -huh. I don't always, you know, toe the line and my intent is good. My technique sucks sometimes, you know, you've met me, <laughs> but um, I have a lot of champions. Yeah. And giving me second chances. I've not made a lot of big mistakes. This one is a bit of a pass for me. Okay. I've been quite deliberate about managing my career wisely. Uh -huh. Not, um, I'm a fairly impulsive person, uh -huh. but I've tried to regulate that in my career because, like I said, I know my professional values. I'm very clear yeah. on them. Yeah. I think most people know their personal values. And that's where most people stop. My personal values are Phil Pal, P H I L P A L, purpose, health, integrity, loyalty, positivity, abundance, and learning. I know my seven personal values. Nice. I then took it a step further and said, 
what are my professional values? The first one is income. I work to earn money. I want to maximize my income, period. That's why I work. I work to earn money and to create financial independence for me and my family. Mm-hmm. My second number one professional value, and I say it unabashedly, and I don't care if you or anybody else likes it, they're my values, and your opinion of them does not matter to me. Yeah. And that's how everybody else should pick their values. My number one value, maximize my income. My number two professional value is I want to work with and for an organization that I am proud to associate with. Yes. If I didn't care about that, I, there, was, there are ways to earn more money faster. Mm-hmm. Had I sacrificed my number two value to work with an organization that I was proud to associate with. Uh-huh. My number three value is to work with people I trust and love and care about. Yeah. And so I've always used those three values to make my professional decisions to also know when are they in conflict with my personal values? Mm-hmm. And because sometimes they are. And if right. people haven't done the exercise around knowing your personal values, and your professional values, then you can't make great decisions on your career. And you also can't know when are you perhaps spinning your wheels because your number one personal value might be family. Uh But if your number one professional value is money and it's not working out for you and you're in sales, you're like, well, you can't earn more money in sales if you're not traveling. You can't earn more money if you're not willing to relocate. And if grandpa is your number one personal value and being close to him, then you might wonder now, or not wonder why they're not working. So I think it's great to know when they are in conflict. That's a good thing, Uh because then you can decide, should I change one of them or should maybe my professional values not be max my income because I wanna be around grandpa until he passes away. Uh And so I'm gonna put that value on hold and I'm gonna have my personal values trump them. I think most people stop at identifying their personal values and don't take it a step further on their professional values. Really, really good. A different like, answer to your question, I know. No, no, no. But it was, it was, it was so wise. I, I loved it. Um, I, I want to be um, careful. I'm watching the time. I would love to ask you two more questions. Sure. Um, but then I, I, I also would love to just give you know one or two opportunities to to people here to ask you questions. I, I think one question I want to ask you is what made the best employee that you ever had? Yeah. The best employee you ever yeah. had. Oh, I'm super clear on this. It's self-awareness. Everyone I have ever terminated, every one of them, they were never from a lack of education, a lack of technical company. They had the know-how to do the job. Every termination has always been because they lacked Mm self-awareness. They didn't know what it was like to work with them. They didn't know what it was like to be in a trade show booth or launch a product or be in a zoom call or be in a team meeting they had no idea what it was like working with them they completely lacked self-awareness so the best employees are those that seek and crave feedback they ask people what's it like to work with me what's it like to lead me what's it like to be a partner with me what's it like to launch a product with me they ask people these questions they go home to their husband and say What's it like to be married to me? They go to their neighbor and they say, what's it like to live next door to me? Now, everybody says, oh, you're awesome. We love you. No, 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 no. There's got to be things that I do that annoy you. Of course there are. Please tell me. Yeah. And when they do tell you, don't say, I I, I already knew that and say, oh my gosh, that's so helpful. Ouch, that hurts. But thank you for sharing that. Right. That is so valuable. I've got a blind spot around this. Can I ask you another question? Why do you think I do that? This is so helpful. Do I seem like insecure or paranoid or in over my head? Do I seem threatened? This is so helpful. Please yeah. share this with me. It's that kind of employee that craves the feedback that builds their self-awareness so they can course correct and minimize or eliminate their blind spots. Huh? Those are the most valuable employees. Good stuff. Now, I, you, you probably know what I'm going to ask you next. I want to know what made the best boss you ever had, the best yeah. boss you ever had. Yeah, his name was David Covey. He was huh? one of Dr. Covey's sons. He has since left the firm. But he was the manifestation of what Don Clifton and Marcus Buckingham wrote about in their Gallup books, Now Discover Your Strengths. It really was this idea of running with your strengths and not trying 
to shore up all your weaknesses. And so David Covey helped me to really understand where was my sweet spot. I hated meeting with CEOs. I hated meeting in the executive suite 40 stories up where everything was like mahogany and arrogance. And I, even though I was in the C-suite, I hated that. I liked meeting with human resource professionals and line managers and directors who actually were doing the work and understood what was really going on in the company. And he gave me permission. He said, stop meeting with CEOs. Stop flying around in jets. Just go meet with the people who love you and you're going to crush it. He gave me permission to run with my strengths and stop trying to be all things to all people and be paranoid about the areas of my job where I was not great at. Now, he didn't give me license to phone those in. I had to manage the p and I had to hire and fire. I had to have tough conversations. I'm actually quite good at those, as you probably can tell. But he really taught me, Scott, you've got genius and talent that's unique to you. Let's explode that and not spend precious tr time trying to become the best you know, analyst of your financial pipeline. Uh -huh. Have someone else do that for you. Uh -huh. That's that's. Fantastic. Scott, you're so wise. You, I absolutely love talking to you every single time. Um, and I mean, tell my of, wife, tell Stephanie how wise I am. Hey, Steph, yes. can you come in? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so what, we're recording this so she can, you can play it back for her. Um, but I just want to thank you for being here. Do you have time for a question or two? I'd love to. I'd love to. Amazing. Do you, does anybody have a question they want to throw at Scott? It can't be about blockchain, Six Sigma. <laughs> lean manufacturing or cryptocurrency. Anything else? Bring it on. I'm here then. <laughs> Those are not my sweet spots. Hi, this is Tina and I love lean methodology. So we can talk about that, Scott. <laughs> um, no, one thing that's interesting and the timing of this is perfect. So thank you. And Mindy has known me. We've known each other for decades, which is awesome. She knows where I am in my career. Um, and I'm actually on my new job search. And in an interview, I don't think I would have any problem kind of highlighting my strengths and all of the wonderful stuff um, that me and my teams have been able to accomplish and achieve, et cetera. But once I'm in the role, I'm very apprehensive to toot my own horn, if you will, to where when you said, you know, make sure you're on those mission critical, et cetera, I think I am, but I'm so cognizant not to highlight myself. I'll highlight the team, others, but I don't feel comfortable nor necessarily like I should have to hindsight probably should <laughs> highlight myself as much. Any thoughts, tips on that? I, I do. I, I think it can be somewhat situational. Some organizations, you have to highlight your own um, uh, successes because no one else will stay far from that company. Other organizations have a very abundant um, mentality where they We'll, we'll, we'll seek out to give credit to you. I think there's a balance, Tina. I think there's a balance. I'm very comfortable talking in I language. I'm very comfortable talking in we language. I, I move back and forth between those effervescently. If I did something I'm proud of, I will say, I did this and I'm proud of it. If we did something, I will say we. I just make sure that there is a balance between we and I. So I think perhaps... Some introspection on your part is obviously, you know, warranted. That's for all of us, quite frankly, is to say, what's holding you back? Did you work for a leader that shamed you if you ever took credit for something you did? Was it your parents? I mean, you know, all of us have deeply inculcated belief systems and mindsets. We behave the way we do for reasons. And oftentimes it's our parents that deeply inculcated belief systems in us. But I think you're on the right track. The fact that you're mindful and self-aware of this is half the challenge, right? Is, is, is to be confident in what you've contributed and don't be afraid to talk about it and know the culture of the firm. If the culture of the firm really values we language, then use that. If they value I language, then perhaps use that, not at the expense of ever selling your team members out. But I mean, don't be foolish. This is good advice to everyone, not just Tina. Don't be naive, don't be foolish. I'm very comfortable talking about things that I have done and what I landed. I'm comfortable talking about what others have done as well. I just make sure there's a great balance of it. And I know my audience. I know what my audience values. And I'll make sure I use words that fit the situation. 
It doesn't mean my, doesn't mean my, my character changes. I just am smart to speak the language of the people that I'm with and what they appreciate. Kristen, you have a question? Do you actually, I, I just want to follow up on that real quick, Scott, is do you think it's the kind of thing also that, you know, it it's, you, you kind of have to do it to get comfortable with it. And, and maybe the more you do something like that, the more you talk about your own strengths and your- You just described bourbon. You just described the high dive at the local pool. You just described surgery. Yeah. You just described dog right. Of course, yeah. yeah. What a great insight. I think it's something that you actually grow into, Tina. Um, and I'll, I'll applaud you. I think your intent is really well situated. You want to raise your team. You want to share credit. You obviously are a naturally abundant thinking person. But I don't think the opposite of abundance is scarcity. I don't think that if you're not abundant, then you're scarce. I think there's a middle ground there where if you don't champion your work, who else will? Now, it might be your boss. It might be the CEO. It might be the founder. It might be a colleague. But I would never, if those people don't exist and prove themselves that they are willing to share credit with you, then you have to make sure that people are aware of your contribution. Ideally, we wish every one of our leaders would say, hey, team, come around. I want to share with you all the successes that Tina and her team have accomplished. But if that person isn't in your life, then you have to rise to the occasion and make sure that that, that, that message is communicated. Yes. Absolutely. Right. Kristen, you're up. Yes, thank you. This has been so informative. It's such a different kind of perspective for me because it's, you know, I'm not in the position of having to fire anybody. Right. I've never been in that position. I've learned so many things tonight. Thank you for that. My question relates to the, the part of the conversation that you talked about. My job is my career. Yeah. It's not my life. Yeah. Have you always had that mentality or no. is that something that you developed over time? Oh, definitely. I mean, I told you I was single till I was 41. My career was my entire identity. My entire, I thought about it seven days a week. I worked it into every conversation. I had no life balance. I would, I think it's, and I also think it's, I think it's worse in men than it is in women. Maybe that's wrong, but I think women tend to be better at pursuing interest and having rich relationships than men do. And I think men tend to, by and large, have their identities define them more than women do. At least that's been my experience as a leader and as a male. And so it was when I became in love with my wife and we married quickly and had three boys that, you know, um, my identity is still correlated to my job because my wife is a stay-at-home mom, fortunately, highly educated, but I, I am the provider of our family solely. I have four people who are 100% dependent upon me for all their financial needs, braces, concert tickets, gas in the car, dermatology, pediatrics, everything. And I take great pride in that. that. That is a huge identity I have as a provider for my family. But that is different than letting my career define me, my title, my income. So I'm trying to separate that. One of my roles in life is as provider. And I take it insanely seriously. I've made commitments that I'm not willing to un dishonor. But that's different than am I, am I a vice president, executive vice president. Now, might, might say, Scott, easy for you to say, you've had all those. You don't care as much. So I get that. But I do think there is great wisdom, especially now in the, in the, in the I would say post-pandemic, Kristen, you know, we're far from post-pandemic, but you know, we've heard this phrase, the great resignation, right? Where everyone's quitting their jobs. This week, Ariana Huffington renamed it the great reevaluation. And I think that's so wise because everybody's values have changed during the pandemic, whether you had a, a relative that passed away, you lost a job, you had COVID yourself and you had a moment of crisis in your life and your mortality, you know, something you face for the first, everybody's values have shifted. And I think you're seeing a sea change of people who don't love their career any less and they're not as any less passionate about their jobs, but their identity is much less connected to their title, to their profession, 
than it was maybe a year or two ago. That, that's going to fundamentally change how people go to college, the degrees they get, the jobs they take, what they are and aren't willing to accept from poor leadership or comes to bad culture. There is going to be a massive burden placed upon leaders, entrepreneurs, founders inside companies because the employees are no longer willing to tolerate subpar conditions or crappy leadership or boorish bosses or any of that. That's a good thing, but leader beware. Hmm. If you thought you were the linchpin before the pandemic, oh, you are the linchpin now because you decide what kind of culture is and isn't created inside your organization, whether you're a team leader, a division leader, a platform leader, or a company leader. So good. Thanks, Mindy. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Um, well, I think that we're unfortunately out of time. I would love to ask you 8,000 more questions, but um, I know that you've got a family to get to. Thank you so much for being here and sharing yourself and your knowledge. We, we so appreciate it. Hey, Mindy, my pleasure. It may not apply to everybody listening or hearing, but if you connect to me on LinkedIn and send me a message, I've created a online course called Ignite Your Genius, Move from Axinal to Deliberate Your Career. It's got 11 video modules and there's a workbook. I'll send you a free tuition to it. Just look me up on LinkedIn, send me a message and I'll give you a free tuition. There's 11 video modules that I've created. You can watch them and whenever you're at leisure, but it helps to get clear on your professional goals. And Tina, you're in the middle of a search right now. I'd be honored to do that. Send a message to Mindy, connect to me on LinkedIn and to all of you that are listening, either live now or later recorded, I'm happy to give you a complimentary tuition to my Ignite Your Genius course. Reach yeah. out and I'll give you a tuition. My I've pleasure. heard amazing things about it. That's so generous, Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Mindy. Nice meeting you all. Pleasure. You, you guys have a wonderful evening. We will. Thanks so much. Good to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.